One of the biggest skills every woodworker seems to want to develop at one point or another is milling up their own lumber. And even just a preliminary look around the internet, you're gonna find a huge variety of the different types of mill you can buy, and most people are going to be dissuaded by how expensive everything seems to be just to start. Well, over the last year, I've tried a number of different milling methods, including running a wood miser, a wooden bandsaw mill that I built myself, and this year I decided to try out a steel 661 chainsaw mill. Although the other options do work, I found that when milling really large trees, it's better to bring the mill to the log rather than trying to move the log to the mill. Then once you have the slabs separated, you can move them around a lot easier by hand. So in this video, I'm going to go over my new chainsaw mill and milling attachments, what I learned that I didn't need to buy, and what I wish I had started out using in the first place, which can help you bring down the price of your brand new milling operation. The first thing to consider is which saw you need. Now, I'm certainly not beholden to any specific brand, but personally, I really like steel. Although there are a lot of people in my comments that tell me I should switch to something like a Husqvarna. Personally, it makes no difference to me what you use, but it is important that you have something that can handle the size of wood you're planning on milling. I was able to track down the 661 Magnum Chainsaw, which seems to be more than sufficient to operate this 42 inch bar and ripping chain. With this setup so far, I have been able to mill just a little bit wider than 3 feet, and although of course it bogs down just a little bit when I cut through the log, a few well placed wedges solves that problem pretty easily. On top of that, I was able to pick up the saw for a little bit under $1,000, which seems a lot until you consider that this is the second most powerful saw that steel sells at 7.2 horsepower. I had considered trying to find the biggest saw that steel sells, which is an 881, but that one is a lot harder to find used, and new, it would have been about $1,200 more than what I paid for this one. And when all is said and done, it only gives you about an extra horsepower or so. For me, that doesn't really seem worth it, and like I said, this saw plows through pretty much everything I've thrown at it so far, and in my opinion, if you're planning on setting up a chainsaw mill, this is one of the best places to start. Once I got this chainsaw and I knew it ran properly, I fit it with this 42 inch bar and ripping chain. Keep in mind that the size of the bar is not necessarily how wide you're going to be able to mill because of the way the mill attaches to the saw. A well-sized mill with this bar can mill up a tree a little bit over 3 feet wide, and I'll show you a little bit later in the video how you can get even more capacity out of this mill. I tried looking for a steel brand bar that gave me the capacity that I wanted, but unfortunately I couldn't track one down that I knew would fit. But I was able to find this bar and two chains for less on Amazon, so I'll leave a link to the ones I used as well. Now we get to talk about my favorite part, which is the mill itself. This I bought in two parts as well. I bought the mill off of Amazon, and I'm pretty sure it's a knockoff version of the Granberg Alaskan mill, but in my opinion, it works just fine. I know there's going to be a lot of you who want to buy the official mill off of the Granberg website, so I'm going to leave a link in the description to that one, as well as the one that I am using off of Amazon. This version came with this top mill guide, and the way this works is you need something to put on top of the log to use as a flat reference so that your first slab is flat on top. Then after that first cut, you can reference off of that flat surface for the rest of the cuts. Although this top guide does technically work, I ended up switching it out for a 2x12 and simply screwed it into place because the pre-made guide didn't seem to want to stay put. I really think that this comes down to personal preference, but if I was going to buy this again, I would not buy this top guide. For me, this guide was really annoying. It was a pain to set up, it wouldn't stay put while milling, and it even dripped down in the middle while I was milling so it didn't give me a perfect flat reference that I needed for the rest of the cuts. So in my opinion, just ditch the pre-made guide and make one yourself. So now that we have everything assembled and we've made our first top cut, we can start using that top surface as a reference to mill up the rest of the slabs. This is probably one of the easiest ways to cut the slabs out of the log, but if you feel like you don't have enough capacity, you could also cut it into a cant and then mill the square boards directly out of the tree. That is one of the best ways to increase the size of the tree that you could hypothetically mill with this system. Just keep in mind that if you aren't able to flip the log over, this isn't going to work, but if you cut the log into a square first, you won't have to worry about the sides of the log running into the sides of the mill, and that gives you more of an opportunity to cut bigger trees. Once I had my mill all set up, it occurred to me that the only limiting factor of these mill guides is how wide these bars are, and of course, you can buy a mill in whatever size you want. But a workaround to this is it's really easy to extend these mills if you get some of these connecting pieces. I took one of these off the top of the mill guide I don't use anymore, and you can just extend the mill to whatever size you want. I also took this middle bar off of my mill since it wasn't long enough anymore, and my plan was originally to replace it with something store-bought. But honestly, the mill works perfectly in this configuration, so I just never bought one. In the previous configuration, configuration, I was only able to get about 33 inches of cutting capacity out of the mill, and with this new configuration, I can get a full 36 inches of capacity. 
However, believe it or not, I can get even more capacity out of this by removing the dogs, moving the mill over a bit, and clamping directly on the rivets over the front sprocket of the bar. Okay, I need to stop right here and explain that a lot of people are going to tell me this is a bad idea because it can prematurely wear out the bar. And it absolutely can, but I have found that a lot of people have used this method for increasing the capacity of the mill, and if you clamp directly over the rivets without putting too much pressure on them, it shouldn't affect the sprocket at all. One of the tests that I use to make sure that I'm not binding on the sprocket is I move the chain manually a few times to make sure that there's no resistance on the front sprocket. And if you clamp directly to the rivets themselves, it shouldn't put any pressure on the sprocket. Now I am not specifically telling anyone that they should be doing it this way, but if you do, you can get a few more inches of capacity out of your system without having to buy a longer bar. Doing this to my saw brought up the total capacity to 39 inches. Nice. So now that I've tried milling in a few different ways, I would say from personal experience that running a chainsaw mill is going to be the best place to start for anyone looking at getting into milling. All of the parts are readily available and they're easy to find. And all things considered, it's one of the easiest and cheapest methods of milling large trees. Sure, you could go out and build a wooden mill like I did for under $500 and that actually does work. But there are a few downsides to consider with that plan. You also have to make sure that you get yourself a trailer that can pick up any of the logs that you want to mill, and anytime you're running a bandsaw blade, you're most likely going to have issues with the blade wandering. And of course, there's always ways to mitigate blade wandering, but it's so much easier just to have a rigid chain simply rip a straight line through the wood rather than worrying about it. It's sort of like the difference between trying to cut a straight line on a bandsaw versus a table saw. Obviously, you can do it with both, but a table saw is of course going to be a lot easier because you know the blade can't really wander. So, thank you all for watching. Let me know down in the comments if you have any questions on this setup or where to get specific parts that you saw me use in this video. I do my best to read all of the comments that come through on my channel, and YouTube seems to prioritize questions in my notifications, so if you have a question, I'll do my best to answer that. And if you can answer any of the questions you see down in the comments, feel free to do that as well. I love it when we can all help each other get to where we want to go, so thank you to those of you who want to do that. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button on the way out, and I'll catch you all in the next video.